Thanks very much for tuning everyone. Byron White here with Mary Morrood. Mary, welcome. Hi, Byron. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Right on. I'm just going to go through a few practicalities for the day. I assume everyone's seeing my screen here. And if so, I will chime along and show a couple of things. Before we begin, this webinar is being recorded, as all of ours are, and look for an email with a link to a recording and a, the, the ability to download the, the, the deck. Uh, we'll talk, um, we'll have at least a, a sort of a 15 minute Q&A at the end. I will have some questions line up in my curious nature um, that I'll run through myself with Mary. Uh, but then after that, and by the way, we're in our new offices. You can hear some fun sirens outside. We're right across from the Boston Garden here in downtown Boston. Uh, sorry about the noise. Uh, but let's see, we've got uh, some action on Twitter happening with the pound sign right on. So that'll be fun for people. And then here's a quick little factoid that I love to tell everybody. I was talking with Kate a little bit about, you know, we introduced myself and I'm like, Kate, I think people know who we are. And sometimes we get new people on the show, but uh, on the webinar, but um, I'm not sure if anybody would is, cares about this, but it's sort of an interesting factoid. When I left college, I was a philosophy undergraduate major and I got a job with Arthur Anderson of all things to go back to school to get my MSPA. Um, and strangely enough, I had some interesting uh, things going on in my life, one of which was I loved motorcycles. More specifically, I had a Triumph 1969 Bonneville motorcycle with a license plate on the back of it that said sweet. And let me tell you, when I walked into Arthur Anderson with this motorcycle uh, one day, I became quickly the, the conversation piece of, is that the Byron White that works at Arthur Anderson that's driving a motorcycle that has a license plate that says sweet on it? So uh, I'm all for adventure and, and taking on big challenges. And uh, we're going to take on a big challenge today with social media and try to figure out, with Mary's help, how we can really get serious about social media marketing and, and, and align ourselves with the right goals, namely profit and PR and SEO. So I'm super excited to hear Mary's presentation today. And without further ado, Mary is is a, is a is a, uh, rather than a last name more rude. You should have a last name Mogul. You've been uh, you've been uh, traveling the world and speaking about about this fine topic we're going to hear about. You also write regularly for Search Engine Watch and of course the the Aim Clear blog, uh, and really you've done an incredible amount of, of you've accomplished quite a bit for for being such a young, happy person. So hats off to you for uh, for all that you've done and, and, and how deeply you've, you've uh, chosen to, to dive into the topic that you're going to speak about today and others that surround it. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to encourage everybody to go quickly over to help our poll. Um, and this will actually help uh, Mary a little bit as well. Um, and uh, that will be fun for everybody to sort of dive into. If you could just sort of answer these questions right now, that would be awesome. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Mary. So I'm going to change the presenter. Yep, I, guess. I see some results of the poll coming in. It looks like almost everybody has voted with Facebook as most valuable um, than LinkedIn. So I'll show you the results so you can see where uh, you fall, Ooh, Facebook, nice. LinkedIn, then Twitter. Um, I'm interested what that other is, so feel free to chat in if you're, what your other channel uh, is. And then, um, yeah, uh, right over to Mary. Right on. Mary, the floor is now yours. I've changed the presenter, I believe, over to you. Excellent. I'll start showing my screen. All right. Can you see it okay? Yes. Fabulous. I will mute Excellent. the sirens in the background, but I will chime in as needed with a couple questions throughout the presentation to spice it up. And without further ado, over to you. Excellent. Well, welcome, everybody. And again, thank you for having me. Um, I, I love speaking at conferences, writing. Um, webinars are um, so much fun. They're so interesting, though, because you don't get that, that real-time feedback. But um, 
I love doing them and hope you guys get, get a lot from this. So today we're going to talk about some serious um, and maybe not so serious, fun at times, social uh, media marketing for um, profit, PR, and SEO. So today we're going to talk about how, um, how to actually acquire links and social signals and why they are critical for SEO. Um, the campaign mechanisms for uh, really great success, um, I pulled these out of uh, tactics that I see not only um, new people on our team, but uh, you know people in the industry and from auditing accounts, some things that they overlook, or uh, you know things that can just do that little tweak that makes the campaign that much more successful. Uh, we have some potent PR and blogger and writer targeting to share with you, and that's um, without a doubt. Uh, my first favorite thing to do is face Facebook targeting and then my second favorite thing is packaging and what we mean by packaging when it comes to content and social media is packaging is just the copy and the image that goes along with the link um, and makes it look really nice and social so I'm sure all of you content producers have your OG tags all uh, spiffed up and optimized and up-to-date but we'll go through some other options how to uh, reshare share more and get the most uh, most value and the most legs out of every piece of content so yes social signals matter and they impact SEO since the Hummingbird update, um, we've kind of realized that Google has always been able to look at social signals. They've always been able to see them, but they just kind of didn't know what to do with them. Um, Eric Enge wrote this really great post on um, Search Engine Land, and he did a hangout with Danny Sullivan, and they kind of kicked around back and forth about what social signals really mean to Google's um, algorithm. And so, um, check that out I encourage you to it's maybe like a five minute three minute hangout so really quick but ultimately yes yeah, social signals matter and that's everything from people clicking like on your content piece on your website from that little Facebook chiclet um, or you know liking and social traffic from social etc so uh, that's not to say that you get a hundred plus ones from Google Plus on your post and your contents automatically going to rise to the top of the SERPs so we we know better than that we know that there's a whole lot of other things that go into it um, I believe it was Danny Sullivan who kind of came up with this analogy, but I love it because it just makes so much sense, especially for um, those of us who are state-based. We can really, um, we, we can really like grab onto this theory. So um, links back in the old day were kind of like voting for the president in um, in the early colonies of the United States. So you could only vote for the president if you were a man, if you were white and if you're rich so like if you own property so think about that as an analogy for early website owners so people who own domains uh, who wrote and linked to other websites was their way of casting a vote for other pieces of content other websites uh, so you really had to have your own website before you could vote for that other piece of content or other website with the inundation of social media and uh, of course times change in the United States everyone can vote now with social media everyone kind of has their own little website or their own little you know staked claim in the in the internet uh, where they say this is what I like this is what's on my mind this is what I'm sharing this is what's cool right now to me so everyone kind of has their own like whatever rented apartment because no one owns Facebook except Mark Zuckerberg um, so we all have our own little rented apartment uh, online whether it's Twitter Facebook LinkedIn Instagram reddit profiles etc but like this is what Google's looking at now they're looking at our rented pieces of property and what we're talking about and what we're posting about and all the traffic that's coming from those so um, in terms of content distribution what are we looking for uh, when it comes to distributing our content ultimately we want to maybe generate money for our affiliates uh, friendship with our community we want to, we want our content to be of value to them we also want our content to 
put our brand or us in the frame of mind of our consumers that we are thought leaders and we are, you know, changing the world and um, paving new paths and like we're the ones that they should look to um, for X, you know, X, whatever industry you're in, whatever product you're selling. We also want to do lead gen and we want cookie pools. And by cookie pools, I mean, capturing everyone who comes to your site, whether it's from search, whether it's from social, capturing all those people into a refined cookie pool that you can then later pass on to performance marketers to exploit or to then further uh, brainwash, I mean nurture uh, them into the buying process. Uh, and certainly we could rant on about the decrease of organic social reach. Uh, Facebook reach is now down to like 1 to 2 percent. Uh, Twitter reach is maybe going away faster than like we're prepared for, but that doesn't really matter because like content and the targeting right now is like at a peak where it is the greatest and uh, targeting almost blows the whole like organic reach out of the water whatever I'm willing to pay for my content and those thought leadership pieces to really make um, the right impression with the right audience. I don't care if they liked me five years ago, they may not be relevant anymore. But the thing about content is you have to make it great. Like it has to give you goosebumps, it has to make you smile, it has to boil your blood, right? It has to provide the reader a benefit. Maybe it's making them feel like they are a part of a community or like everyone or someone else thinks the way that they do. So make it great. And I know everyone says that, like it has to be good content, but the truth is like you write a crappy piece of content, people are gonna think it's crap and it's not, you know, it's not gonna do you any good. So content is worth a great investment um, and great can mean so many things depending on your own organization your own internal structure but if you have to go outside and uh, record yourself changing the wheel of a tire for your blog or your um, your boss or your client go do it um, Airbnb had this uh, new A Night At recap recently, and I know um, Byron is out in Boston, so I thought I'd throw, throw this in. I watched this just yesterday, and like, oh, maybe I'm, it's just like, I'm emotional with the seasons changing or Mercury and retrograde, but like, it gave me the sniffles. Um, so if you're a Boston Red Sox fan, check that out, because it's pretty cool. Um, they wrote about Fenway Park and staying there. Um, targeting in social is so great to the point where you can target writers, you can target PR professionals, you can target people who work at the New York Times um, with your content and this is a great way, I, I love doing this because it makes them think that it's their idea, it makes them think that they stumbled upon it and decided to write about it for yourself. So like this strategy of promoting your content via social is your new link building strategy. So we'll jump to some often overlooked campaign mechanics because we have a lot to talk about when it comes to creative. Excuse me, cup, drink of coffee. Mm. Okay. While you're there, I yeah, go ahead. Oh, hey, Mary, your sound is cutting out. Um, can you repeat yourself? Sure. Here, let me. Throw some earbuds in. Maybe this will be perfect. All right, how does it sound? Sounds good to me. Excellent. Thank you. No problem. All right, so again, these are certain things that I see tried and true business professionals missing when doing Facebook campaigns, um, even some of you know, some things that I forget sometimes. So get out a sheet of paper, make a little checklist. Uh, placements. These are one of the most important things to pay attention to. So obviously you package your content and it looks the best 
when it is displayed on the news feed. So not the right column, not the audience network. So it has that big, beautiful image, the headline, the nice big headline. You have your update text and link description. You not only get the most real estate when it comes to doing your ads this way and selecting these placements, but it also um, is, is more consistent. So if you leave the desktop right column placement selected, which Facebook makes all of these selected by default, by the way. So it's up to you as an advertiser to really pick and choose which ones are providing you the best ROI. And I'll say right now, um, in our experience, it's been the mobile news feed and the desktop news feed. Uh, if you're going to leave the desktop right column open, just be aware that the headline which is normally underneath the photo in the newsfeed is on top of the body copy in the right column. Whereas when you read it in the newsfeed, the body copy is what's above the image, and then you have the image, and then it's the headline. So just a heads up, people may read things backwards if you have uh, if you've written it intentionally, which you do very much should when you're doing this packaging. So a couple of bidding strategies always test for your audience, but um, it's a, it's a good rule of thumb that a small audience, you want to overbid your CPC of a large audience. Um, you have a auto-optimized CPM. Oftentimes, CPM will get you the greater reach, but CPC will get you um, more efficient clicks. Another important thing to do is to grab your conversion pixel. So whether, and uh, this doesn't have to be, you know, thinking about like shopping, it can be someone who maybe contacted you through your blog, or it could be someone who hit three specific other blog pieces that you wrote um, within that time frame. So people who are like really engaged, you want to be sure you're tracking, tracking that. So um, whether it's people who reached out to you via your blog, maybe visited, um, two or more other blogs of yours on your domain, or uh, perhaps like spent a certain amount of time. Um, Optimize CPM also works best when your audience size is at least half a million to a million. That's what works best, that's what Facebook tells us. Um, but some bidding tactics like we talked about, you want to um, select your, your budget and schedule in your ad set. And um, unfortunately, Facebook really hides your, your bidding here, so you have to click to advance, show advanced options. Um, it will ultimately default to optimize for post engagement, uh, which is not surprising. Facebook wants to keep everyone on Facebook, uh, interacting on Facebook. But we as content marketers, we want to get people off to our own website and then be able to cookie them, convert them there. So what we do is we do um, optimize for clicks and then we can either set the desired amount we want to pay per click or we can let the system do its own thing um, and kind of get the most clicks at, at the best price, which is what we typically set it for um, initially and then we will oftentimes like optimize down towards a desired um, CPC. Time of day, so ad sc scheduling is something that's pretty new and it's um, and it's something that is, again, also kind of hidden in Facebook's um, budget and schedule. So you want to show advanced options, and ad scheduling is below that as well. Um, here you can select when your ads will be shown or when your content promotion will be shown between the hours of, let's see, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. here. Um, the really great thing about this is that you don't have to do any time zone calculations. This is reflective of people's, um, your targets in their own time zone. So though I'm in Minnesota, hey, um, hey Minnesotans, Duluth, um, you know, where it's like 9 a.m. here, it's going to be, you know, 7 a.m. on the West Coast, it's going to be 10 o'clock on the East Coast, uh, so it'll just shut off at 9 a.m. wherever your users are, their, their own 9 a.m., let's say. Um, so ultimately, like I said, CPC gives you um, less reach, but more clicks, more efficient clicks, and uh, typically with CPC, we see a higher CTR. Um, you will pay more for uh, 
reaching more people. So you get a bit of a higher eCPM. Um, these were taken from tests that we did that were specifically CPC versus CPM. Same audience, same packaging, uh, same blog post, same amount of money. Um, and this is what we found. So like the CPN, less clicks, way more reach, lower CTR. So ultimately, um, say up to you and what your objective is for your campaigns, but always like pay attention to the CTR. That will impact how much you pay for ads in the future. Um, it's also important that you, you know, you want clicks to your website, not just clicks, and that's clicks, see, excuse me, bidding CPC is a way to get more clicks to your website and get those users in your own cookie pools. So we'll chat about some targeting for links and PR next. Um, again, those are just some high level campaign mechanics that I see often overlooked and wanted to, to bring those to, to y'all's attention. Um, there is a bevy of writers, reporters, anchors on Facebook. This only scratches the surface, but we've um, these are all available in job title targeting in Facebook. So you have news anchors, writers, bloggers, and you can find job titles um, in Facebook targeting under more demographics. So you have editors in chief, the ones pulling the strings, really. You have journalists, reporters, those on the front lines um, crafting the stories. Um, you have senior political correspondents. You can get even really specific depending on what your content style is, what you're writing about. You can target uh, war correspondents or international correspondents, um, producers and showrunners, right? So understand that it's not all about whoever's writing the piece of content. They have to get buy-in from their their senior um, <clears throat> senior co-workers to actually get things published. Um, so you also have interests. You can target writers by interest. So people who like the Association for Education and Journalism or the American Copy Editors Society, right? So like, I have, I'm really into writing, but like, holy cow, I'm not that into writing, right? So people who like professional associations are usually in jobs that are directly related to those professional associations. There's also a ton of blogger um, blogger job titles. You can also find these bloggers via the interest targeting. Um, but bloggers are really awesome because they will likely be less picky than serious news organizations like the Wall Street Journal to link to your your content or maybe you know write in tandem with you. So blogger outreach is a great way to target these people in in Facebook. Um, you can also target them by the tools that they use. And the tools that they use are like content management systems, WordPress, Blogger of the Service, etc. Um, the, and the real cool thing is like you can mash up like your job titles. So like uh, blogger, writers, um, editors in the job title and then add on interest about specifically what you're writing about. So if you're um, writing a piece about, you know, parenting and, and hipster fathers, you can target writers who work at the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Star Tribune, um, so they're writers and editors, and they're interested in parenthood, or specifically fatherhood, um, as, as like a, as a hobby, I don't I want to say it's a hobby, but like they've shown interest, um, fatherhood actually is one of those really cool, um, targeting categories in Facebook. So you have motherhood, parenting, fatherhood, um, really, really cool stuff. So fatherhood incorporates like any of those tertiary blogs that have that, you know, like daddy bloggers are doing. So all those individual interests are rolled up into this one category. So you could target writers of major publications who are really into fatherhood and get them digesting your content that way. We also have just a ton of public re relations job titles, and these can get really, really specific. Um, and again, with the layering, so you can target writers, um, but one thing that we love to do is targeting people who like Reddit, Dig, or Stumble Upon, right? Because those are three social, um, social platforms that really, really, really hate to be marketed to. 
and they can smell it. Like they're smarter than the average bear. They can smell a marketing message a mile away. But you know what works? Is that when you get a Redditor or a Digger or a Stumbler to post your content for you and you make them think they thought of it by putting it into their Facebook news feed. It's all about getting them to discover your content and getting them to post it on Reddit, on Dig, on Stumbler. Mary, could you give an example of that particular case? It's a fabulous point you're making, but how do you make somebody make them feel like they thought of it? And how you craft it? Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, how you make how you uh, make someone think they thought about posting it on Reddit, Dig, or StumbleUpon? Um, that is a good question. It's all about the really great creative packaging, and it, you could almost um, tease it and say, like, I can't believe I didn't find this on Reddit first. You know, like, oh, if I were a redditor, I'd be like. What? I want to be the first person, right? Got it. Okay, so we'll move on to creative. And I, I typically don't do this with my slides, but I think that this really illustrates um, creative in, in social. Um, and it's all about kind of making, um, drawing your eye to certain words or um, certain things that matter to who you're targeting. So um, this is not the most readable way to write creative, but it's definitely a way that gets people's eyes on it longer. Um, and so what we do with social packaging is we try to draw people's eyes to the important keywords. So whether we do it in parentheses or in all caps or we hashtag it, and the hashtag means nothing, but it turned blue. So um, Ultimately, and we could have a whole session about creative and packaging and images for social because it's really that nuanced, um, but we'll talk at, at a high level. So when it comes to writing ads or packaging content in social, it's miles different than it is for maybe traditional PPC or um, just writing for SEO, right? So you're writing for SEO, you're writing for machines, right? And, you know, feeding them keywords. And you certainly still want keywords in your packaging. Um, but here we're walking a fine line between fitting in tonally to the platform. So, like, Facebook is really about, you know, pretty fun stuff, right? Like, people go there to, like, hang out spend some time, not think too hard, maybe catch up on what's going on. So your content has to fit in in a casual nature, relevant to the reader who's reading it, and um, yet be compelling enough to get them to click. And that's a, that's a fine line we walk because ultimately ads, and I will use air quotes, so like ads in Facebook that are like, buy this now, click here, like, retweet, comment, share, like the demanding ones, people are turned off by that. You know, they they want to do things in their own time, in their own way, and your whole like blaring about what you want them to do isn't going to get them to do much. And also like people don't like ads on Facebook. So as much as you can tone your words, um, tone your packaging, into something that's a little more fun, frivolous, um, interesting, pique their curiosity, like that's what's gonna get users to click. But ultimately, it's really about the images, and we'll get into that in just a second. So, um, when we do social packaging, just like traditional search PPC, it's still important to keep the keywords in the upper left. Um, and this is really, really powerful when you're writing about or speaking directly to a certain audience that is hard to target. So for example, um, if I wrote a blog post about um, how to, you know, like how to decrease your asthma symptoms uh, in the changing seasons, um, I want to, you know, target people who have asthma. And, you know, truly, there aren't very many people on Facebook who say, yeah, I have asthma, and I like it. And, or, like, here's my prescription that I've liked on my pharmacist page, 
that you know makes me think that or makes marketers think that I have asthma. That that, that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? So, in those uh, instances where you have to target a more general population, so like cast your net wide and qualify them with copy. Um, so you want to call out specific people, so like asthma sufferers or bedwetters, women over 35, you know, like moms, um, moms with a second job. Um, you want to call out those specific audiences so that those audiences know that they're you're writing exactly for them. You're writing about them and it's highly relevant to them. Um, also great to at mention or plus mention for Google Plus. Um, uh, at mention in Facebook and Twitter, it not only gives your post a bit more organic reach, um, it will change the text to blue so that, you know, connected third party uh, is in blue. It is like linked to their page. Um, but again, it's about changing the colors and changing the text a little bit to draw the eye to, pe to the important keywords. So like an important third party or an important keyword. Same thing with hashtags. So hashtags in Facebook don't really mean that much. Um, they don't really mean that much in general. Uh, but you can create, you can put hashtags in front of any word that you think is really important or maybe like categorizes the whole sentiment of your post. And what's great about that is that it changes the color to blue. So at mentioning hashtagging in Facebook will change the text color to blue for that entity or that word, um, which again draws the eye. And it's all about drawing the eye from the upper left to the bottom right. And um, so I'll give a brief example of getting more organic proclivity from an out mention. So I like um, Game of Thrones and I don't follow Vox, um, the publication, but I always see them in my newsfeed because they wrote about Game of Thrones and then they at mention them in their writing about them. So, you know, Facebook will say like, hey, this publication is talking about something you like. And you know what? I always end up reading it because I'm a sucker. Um, you also want softer call to action. So again, you want to pique their curiosity. You don't want to give away the farm. And you don't want to say like, click now, click here, read this right now. Um, certainly you can play around with those words, but again, softer curiosity, or softer call to action works a whole lot better. Um, questions, I love questions as a way to engage your audience, like this example from, um, I freaking love science. Uh, how many of these were you taught? Right, five science facts quote that we learned at school that are plain wrong. And I'm asking myself, how many of these did I actually learn and still believe today? So I'm going to read this post. Turns out I uh, learned five facts that were wrong. They were all wrong. Um, in Google Plus, pretty great. You can stylize your text in Google Plus. Um, asterisks around words make them bold. Underscores make them uh, appear in italics, and then hyphens will strike through um, keywords, which I love doing strike throughs. They're kind of fun. Um, when you're writing a blog post, you want to craft your creative packaging in a couple of different ways. So you don't want to craft a blog post, share it once, and then be done with it and hope people picked it up or whatever. No, you want to share it a couple different times in a couple different ways. So um, you want to package them differently and kind of have prompts to begin with. So first is like a book club style, and that's kind of like the, the science one. Ask a question. So after you read the post, what would be a natural question to ask? Um, Reader's Digest. So this is breaking down the blog post into the high-level points, like here's what you're going to learn or read about in this post. Um, the WTF always, always, always works. I don't know why, but like people are just so darn curious in Facebook when you write things that don't make sense at all, at all. So pull the, you know, like the really interesting piece about um, you know about the post and put it in in the update so you could say like uh, you know we have politics going on right now which is just so like rich in terms of WTF moments so you could say like Donald Trump said what about Carly Fiorina um, and then you know follow, follow that up with you know her new ad that came out holy cow that was perfect um, you can also do a plain English version, so like in a nutshell, what is this post about? And it might just be 
the headline that you used. Um, so, you know, for a plain English one, a uh, crazy out of the box one, uh, Reader's Digest and uh, ask a question. Love that tactic. Okay, so thumb stoppers. Um, we have about 20 minutes left. We're, we're almost there. Um, thumb stoppers. So this word is from a New York Times article. Facebook thought of it. Um, this was a great, great, great post, and I encourage you to read it, especially if your content is about something that's really not sexy, like krill oil, supplements, um, yeah, that kind of stuff, like really, really not cool stuff that's really hard to talk about and write about and get people engaged with. Um, so New York Times, how Facebook sold you krill oil. They talked about thumb stoppers. I was like, ah, I get it. Yes. Stopping the thumb from scrolling. So what creates a thumb stopper? Images. And I highlight this image, not because it's the best one, but it's pretty darn good. So the first thing that you saw when you, um, when you went to this slide was most certainly the image. Um, it's kind of, it's what gets our thumbs to stop. It what, it's what draws our eye. Um, I would have certainly put the free trial maybe in the bottom, bottom right, uh, maybe in a different way, enhance the colors. But what you look at first when it comes to Facebook posts is not the update. Um, it's the image. That's what gets you to stop. And so I encourage you to use images that don't make sense, that just look plain weird that are bright, that are bold, um, yeah, plain weird. Weird images work like a charm. Like even if they're unrelated, completely unrelated to the topic, they will often outperform, you know, like the boring stock image photos. Um, so people are going to stop and look at the image first. Next, they're going to probably read the the headline. So after you look at the image, your eyes go naturally down, you and it's also bigger text, so you're going to read the headline. Um, and then maybe, maybe your reader will skip back up and see what you said in, in the update. Um, truly, I don't think many people read much about in the link description, so just be sure that you don't have anything that's um, a value in there. So if what you wrote in your link description is what you're leaning on to get people to click. Like you think they're going to read the update, look at the image, and then read the headline, and then read the link description, and that's when you, they're going to click. No, 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 no. They're not. Um, you have about 25 characters in the headline to get them hooked, and that has to be at the, at the left of the headline. So the first few words, make sure you hook them within the first 25 characters of the headline and the update, but you're really going to get them to stop with that image. And to emphasize why images matter the most, so Airbnb posted this um, this update on their page once uh, Brian Chesky was announced to serve as a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship, which is pretty awesome. The White House, you know, like a budding CEO is, uh, is going to be working with the president. That, that's freaking cool. Uh, but you check out the comments and everyone's talking about the wall color. Like they love turquoise so much. They don't care what the post says. They love the wall color. Images. They're, it's what people are going to pay attention to. So next we'll talk about image processing. But first we have a poll. So we'll pop that up. Yep. Launching the poll And I'll take a now. sip of coffee. Yeah, uh, maybe take get a some breath. caffeine in <laughs> and take a breath going so fast. Um, all right, guys, do you treat, um, a.k.a. process or enhance your images before sharing them on social media? So yes, no, or you're not exactly sure. Um, I don't, probably should, <laughs> but um, I see almost all of you guys have voted. I'll, I'll keep it open for another second. It looks like at least half of you do do treat your images. So um, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about that. Excellent. Mary. Excellent. So, so great that you guys are processing and enhancing your images. Um, I will say that we certainly do that every time and we'll do it specifically for Facebook, we'll do it specifically for Twitter, and we'll do it specifically for LinkedIn to make sure that every which way it's shared in social is the best possible way. Um, 
I will say that this image processing steps that we're going through, um, we go through this in our AimClear workshop um, around SMXs, and I have to say, I just heard back from one of our attendees who said, thanks for the image processing tips, like that alone paid for my workshop attendance. So, um, really impactful, and honestly, um, this is for design wannabes. I'm not a designer, I will say that right now. Um, I'm not super technical, but I know enough to uh, to do this really well. And I will say that, like, if you have designers or working with designers, they're going to hate this. They're going to hate it because you want your images to look almost wrong. You want them to glow and, like, look sort of abnormal almost. And designers, like, hate that because, it, like, it looks wrong and it's not, like, the most pleasing thing to the eye, but you know what? It's the thing that captures the most attention in Facebook. It's the thumb stopper. It's the thing that's going to get them to stop scrolling. So image processing in five steps, and this is really one of the last things we're going to touch on today before we dive into Q&A. Um, first, you want to frame and crop your image, um, and then you want to sharpen that image. Um, next, you're going to select, and this uh, this step you can skip if you um, have an Im image where you don't feel like you need to select a, a certain piece and enhance it, but um, in the example we'll show, we, we select a, a yellow t-shirt and really bring that yellow out. Then we're going to um, crank up the saturation on, on the whole image and then increase or decrease the brightness and then pump up the contrast. So we'll go through a couple steps here. So first you're going to choose your image and um, it, this is going to be a post, um, I think it just got published today in uh, marketing land and search engine land for our targeting hothouse, we're targeting dads in Facebook. So I grabbed a whole bunch of images of dads and like, uh, I'm going to be honest, it, it made my ovaries ache a little bit. They're so cute. Uh, dads with their kids. Um, taking selfies, looking cool, looking adorable. So we ended up choosing the image on the far left, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, first, the I love the second image with all the different colors, and honestly, that's great. Um, but it wasn't close up enough on these the dad and the daughter's face. So I really want to see the emotion. Um, the third image maybe a little washed out. I love the little boy. He's pretty cute, but um, eh, he, he was a close runner-up. The fourth image, oh God, I love that girl. She is just hamming it up for the camera, and that's pretty pretty adorable. But we found that uh, the saturation of the colors in, in the first image and that yellow was really going to pop in social. Also, I'll note that the yellow is on the is on the left, or on the right, excuse me. I'm terrible with my directions. Um, I'm a really good driver, though, so that's good. So yellow is on the right, and what we want to do is we want to draw people's eye from the top top left to the bottom right, right? So we want to draw their eye all the way through the ad. And so having that pop of color on the bottom right is going to draw the eye that way. And if it were on the left, that's fine. We can flip it and flip the image. So here's our image and this is what it looks like naturally and so it looks pretty great. So even if you didn't touch it up or do anything with it, um, great image. I'm going to show you how treating it can really make a big difference. So first we want to zoom and crop. So we're going to crop really close to the face because that's where people's emotion comes from. And what we'll do is we'll start with an optimized canvas. So we always start with 1200 by 628, which is um, the Facebook ratio. And then we're going to resize, put the image in and reframe it. Um, and maybe you want to, you know, tilt it a little bit more or put it completely on its side. I know Marty has done some crazy things and it, you know, surprisingly works every time. The crazier, the better. So we have the image that's, uh, the original image that's a little bit more zoomed out, and then we have the next one that's cropped in and sharpened. So I don't like to over sharpen it, but just, um, you know, pump it up a little bit. And then we're going to select a, a certain color piece in, in the image, and typically it's maybe lips, or and we're going to make them redder. Uh, or maybe it's like an eye color, and we're going to make it bluer. Maybe it's, you know, this yellow shirt, and we're going to make it yellower, more yellow. Um, so we're going to, like, 
take certain colors that contrast Facebook's blue and white design and really pump up the saturation there. So we select them with um, our little wand tools and then we pump up the, the saturation here and then you can see a little bit of a change there. And then we um, change the brightness and increase the contrast. So what we did here on, and here's a little tip, um, bright images or bright things that you want to increase the contrast of that are already bright, you want to actually decrease the brightness, um, which gives a little more um, depth to, to the shadows um, to for the tool to really increase that contrast. So what we want to do is we want to make this almost glow, right? So you can already kind of see the change of the yellow and then what we're going to do is select the whole thing and then crank up the saturation again. So we're cranking up the saturation on the yellow shirt as well as the whole image and then we're going to pump up the contrast and you can see that really like he looks like he's got like a tan. It almost looks very like Instagram filtery which is great because who is your competition in Facebook? It's like Instagram photos. People sharing photos from their vacation of their adorable kid and putting those cool filters on them. So really kind of pump up the colors, make them contrast. You almost want it to glow. You almost want it to glow off of a screen. So make it just undeniably colorful. Um, some search tips for stock photos. Um, I, I know people hate using stock photos, but not every one of us has um, a photographer on hand to do a photo shoot. Um, so look for emotion-based keywords. So when we looked for like dads, we wanted like dads, kids, plus like an emotion keyword, which means like happy or excited or loving, proud, relieved, confident, frustrated, right? So you're going to find enough people who are in suits to really, um, to, to relate to your business blog, or you're going to find people who are in, you know, just everyday wear. Um, doesn't have to be super literal. Um, emotion based keywords really, really work the best. Um, skip pretty much any portrait style image because uh, most images are shared in social at a landscape um, in a landscape orientation and it's really difficult to translate a portrait style image into a landscape. Um, skip washed out images or images that are predominantly white. Um, it can be a really cool tactic to use like a black and white photo every once in a while because it does pop out and look a bit different but if it's you know like too whitewashed skip it they're wearing like khakis white t-shirt on a white background no nope. look for something else real looking it does exist but so remember your competition like I said are like people's beautiful Instagrams of their travels delicious food and uh, adorable children which I gotta say this kid just makes me he stops at them every time and your competition are you know content outlets that invest thousands if on uh, the writers the speakers um, the designers for this custom image they invest thousands in like the production of it so like your competition is pretty stiff um, ultimately your takeaways yeah your organic may be gone but targeting is dead eye and you can target writers um, PR people and you can target the ones who are actually interested in the stuff that you're writing about um, definitely important to set your conversion goals and optimize towards them um, that will give you more bidding capabilities when it comes to promoting in Facebook um, and then packaging is so so critical like I said I could talk a whole hour about that, about writing. Um, most important, draft a couple different packages and share it uh, more than one way. Um, images are really the heroes of of social. So make sure you pick an image that that's a winner that has bright colors that really contrast Facebook. Weird, like I'm gonna say again, weird works. Just it just does. Um, so that is all I have for you today, and we have a couple minutes for Q and A. I'm excited to to answer some questions. Fantastic. I'm going to dive right in, but we're going to get to some of these great questions that have come in. So stay tuned. I have just a couple quick questions for you myself, though. 
Um, do you think Google is connecting the dots these days? You know, I'll give you an example. I, I have a website, byronwhite.ceo, that I use for speaking gigs. I also blog over on Idea Launch. I also blog over on Writer Access. Uh, but then we've got a Facebook Byron White account. But we've got a Facebook, you know, Writer Access account, Facebook Idea Launch account. You think Google is putting to this all together and recognizing me as an author, particularly when they begin looking at, you know, the the who I am and what connections I'm getting and what response I have. What your what's your take on that? Yeah. So we all know what happened to authorship. Google kind of they they played around with it and were really excited about it and then it kind of went away. Yeah. Um, I think that Google certainly um, has that data. They're Google after all. I believe they have that data and they're attempting to connect the dots and maybe it just didn't work quite right right away. Um, but I, I think that they know and uh, whether it really impacts a whole lot right now, I think it certainly will in the future. Next question. I want to ask you about what I call social responsibility. Okay. Do you feel that we have a responsibility to the community, our fans and friends and followers we have in the social sphere to touch their heart or to make them feel part of a community or to cheer them up or to discover or in relay some meaning to them, to tell them what's new. Do you feel like there is a responsibility we have? And if so, how would you define that responsibility? Ooh. Oh, I like that the could, ooh. That could be a loaded question. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I do, I do think that we as content marketers and writers have a responsibility. And I mean, Certainly, depending on, you know, uh, journalists have a responsibility, have more like ethical responsibilities than like mm -hmm. just uh, your run of the mill blogger and uh, have responsibility for being accurate and uh, writing about time timely events. Um, so I think it's important for us as writers. I, I really hate to see inaccuracies online so I think it's important that you know we as writers do our due diligence to be accurate and I also I mean yes like this this could be a conversation that goes on forever but I think that ultimately we have a responsibility not to waste users time so I, I've seen many a blog post that people want us to promote or you know we want to share and I just say like Ugh, it's, it's really not valuable it's really not so like really like take a step back, look at what you wrote and say like, is this really valuable? Is it? Like is it great? Is it going to put a smile on someone's face? Is it or is it just gonna waste their time? Mm -hmm. Excellent one. Okay. Um, I just want to hop in real quickly. Uh, Mary, could you put your takeaways slide back on? We've got a couple sure. of people asking for it. Thank you so much. Great. So um, another question. The ability to promote to a targeted audience, particularly with Facebook and LinkedIn now, is really remarkable. But do you think that you – know, what do you think is most engaging? And do you think that we need some, some do's and don'ts as we promote our, ourselves and our products and services? And by the way, those are two separate questions perhaps. For example, you know, don't sell. You know, do share inf good information. You know, do make life better. You know, be creative with how you do all of this. Think about the sales funnel. I mean, as we target more people, do we need to think deeply about those people and their needs and where they are in our funnel? How do you think that through? And do you have different messages you're sending to these different people that we can target? And how do you think about them? And do you write for them, which is another interesting question, for the particular target that you're carving out? Oh, yes. Ab absolutely. So, um, yes, write for your audience. It's so important. So, recently I wrote a blog post um, that really took inspiration from Stephen Sondheim's documentary. It's on HBO if you have it. I think you can find it on YouTube for free. Um, but Stephen Sondheim, if you don't know him, is a, a composer and a writer of music for Broadway, one of the most famous ones and one of the most beloved. He wrote Sweeney Todd, Into the Woods, the ones that are being um, translated to film because the music is so good. Um, I encourage you to check out that blog post because, yes, it's all about writing 
for your specific audiences and using words that they would really use in, in their own day-to-day -day life. Um, and just about writing for your character, for your audience, yes. Um, write for your audience. It's so important to kind of understand like where where their head is, head is at. And it's always writing these, these packaging um, blog posts is like a mini ad writing assignment every time I step into it. So if it's taking you, you know, more than 20 minutes or more than you think it should to craft a really great package for your um, for your piece of content and only one, that's okay. Like it's going to be hard and it's going to take time, and, and like greatness takes time. So don't beat yourself up if it's not coming organically and you just can't like. Write, write an update and a headline and a link description in five minutes. It's going to take more time than that. Um, we're doing uh, lead gen right now for a company that is all about um, increasing accessibility um, for people who are disabled, specifically in wheelchairs. Um, so our our ad copy says, you know, our use a wheelchair question mark we're specifically calling out to those people in wheelchairs because it's not a category on Facebook um, but so we're targeting you know people who have wheelchair sports in their interests um, people who like specific wheelchair types and brands and then we have like disability associations um, and diseases and disorders that cause disabilities that would put someone in a wheelchair um, and so we, we found, you know, like we're going to target the people who are in wheelchairs and serve them as that say, in a wheelchair, question mark, join our community. And then we have another set of ads for the disability associations because certainly the caregivers, the parents of people in wheelchairs are just as involved or just as impacted by inaccessibility when they go out with them. So we changed the copy there to say, you know, if you, if your parent, loved one or uh, or patient is in a wheelchair we want to hear from you um, so really it is about the different messages and it can make a grand difference in that example talk with us about the separation of church and state and what I mean here is you know creating this new community for this customer they probably didn't have a community that, that offered informational advice and tips and resources for people in a wheelchair that wanted to be part of a community that was all about making their life best smarter better faster and wiser do you feel that that community is critical when you're advertising and promoting on Facebook you know that you need that information that community feel and you want to separate from that from the products and services that, that the company sells yeah well I think in this case what's really surprising because we thought this was going to be much harder and more expensive than than it turned out to be it, it's turning out to be incredibly successful and I'm really excited about it but I think a lot of the success um, is not only packaging and targeting but it's also about reaching, um, like you said, a community that exists, but they're all separate now. So we're, we're providing them a rally point to come together and make a difference for one another and, and the world. So it's kind of, it's, um, it's marketing hope, it's marketing um, inspiration, and it's, you know, it's giving them like a, a service that really didn't exist before, and there was a definite need. Hmm. Um. I want to go to some some questions from our listeners, and thanks for your patience. Um, so for, here's a question. For a small business, less than 5,000 fans, trying to build their engagement and click-throughs, what bid for CPC do you recommend? And that, that relates to Facebook, I think, when you were going through that. Certainly. So um, first, I w I'll just say this in case there's anyone out there who's doing um, a fan or a like campaign. Stop doing that right now. Hmm. Ultimately, like you want people to get to your site based on what you're talking about, um, and you don't want to grow just your likes on Facebook. Yes, you want more likes on Facebook. Yes, you want more followers on Twitter, but you want those to be focused, and you want them to like you or follow you because of what you're talking about, um, and that's about content. So first of all, no, no like or fan campaigns at all. Second, um, what bidding strategy would I use? I would use clicks. Or I would use conversion. So if you are um, a smaller organization, and we'll say maybe you're promoting a white paper, and to get that white paper, you have to submit an email address. Um, 
what you want to do is put your conversion pixel on the, the thank you page for that download of the email address so then you can really optimize mm -hmm. um, and let the let the system or the machine understand like look I only want to pay five dollars for this lead or you know maybe it's ten dollars maybe it's fifteen um, but you tell them what you need to pay and the algorithm really looks at people's attributes and um, pushes your content towards people who they think are going to click and convert. Um, so ultimately, more about clicks and conversions than bidding for engagement. Engagement is great to have on social, but um, getting people to your website is more important. That's what you own. And then you can own those audiences going forward by cooking them and retargeting them in Facebook, in search, um, in display everywhere. So once you get them to your website, you own them. You own them. If they're engaging and doing this, that, and the other thing on Facebook, you, you don't own them at all. Great answer. How effective is job titling since not everyone includes their work experience on Facebook? Is Facebook getting any secret sauce from, say, LinkedIn? Are they have a little secret partnership there that's helping the targeting? <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> so I, I doubt that. Um, but to to be honest, like Facebook is the the place where people are more. Like they're on Facebook more than Google. They're certainly on Facebook more than um, LinkedIn. Um, so LinkedIn is really tied to B two B in people's minds, and they say, you know, if you're going to do B two B targeting, it has to be in LinkedIn. Not true. True professionals are never off duty, um, even when they're on Facebook and scrolling through and like looking at the latest Game of Thrones spoiler. Like I'm still an internet marketer and still susceptible to those messages. Um, even if I were a long distance truck driver, like my back is still going to hurt when I'm looking through Facebook and I'm going to be thinking about maybe getting some extra like lumbar support for my truck. Um, and so it's really important that we understand that Facebook can be like a way to approach professionals in a more casual environment that's not all about selling and not all about, you know, buy my product. Um, it's, it's all about nurturing that, that person. So, yes, job titles in Facebook um, are updated pretty regularly. I can't tell you the last time I updated my LinkedIn profile. Um, it doesn't have my most current job title, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Facebook is people are just more active. They're more engaged. And, you know, I do think that they update their, their job status um, there, especially for working professionals. Um, but the other thing is you can find job titles in the interest um, targeting in Facebook. And so oftentimes I'll find that targeting job titles in the interest targeting field is almost more efficient and more effective than targeting job titles via the job title targeting field. So worth, um, worth testing both for sure. Many people are, are, are struggling with this thirst that Google has for us to publish frequently. So we're banging out more blog posts and more assets than we ever have before and seeing some results from that. You know, I mean, you know, publishing a steady stream of content is, is a very good, healthy thing. We all know that. But are you being selective with what you're pushing out to your social sphere, for example, or are you by default taking every one of your blog posts and, and making a Facebook post out of it? We are certainly selective about which posts we promote. So we only want to promote the ones that like really matter. So I'm not going to um, promote a post where like we recapped like what I talked about at, at a certain conference or like, you know, promote, um, you know, the, the, the fluffier blog posts. Um, and when so, you say promote, you're talking about, you know, paying to promote. Pay Posts, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. You might be publishing them on your Facebook post, announcing to the, to the world that you've made a blog post, but you're not promoting it or wasting time or money to promote things that are not worthy. Right. Correct. Got it. Okay. But also, uh, check out your like. We have seasonal things that happen every year, and yeah. it's certainly worth like not having to rewrite your Thanksgiving blog post every year. You can just reshare it, maybe update it. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on SlideShare? I noticed that was not included in in, uh, in the, the poll or anything you talked about today. Yeah, certainly. So, um, SlideShare is 
certainly worthy um, and also depends on, on what industry you're in. Um, we personally don't use SlideShare uh, because it's too easy for people to steal our content and then um, just repurpose it for themselves. And so we we tend to not not like that. Uh, here's a question. I'm a B2B. We probably don't have time for too many questions, but here's a really good one. Um, if I'm a B2B company where, uh, where the decision maker I want to target is a C-suite of healthcare organizations, is LinkedIn the best play, platform to use? Um, would Twitter or the blogger platforms you mentioned target this audience? Um, I get the feeling top executives of healthcare organizations don't hang out on Twitter or blog sites for content. Am I wrong? We, we get we get this question all the time. Our, our account managers uh, here, you know, what, what's the best platform? Your thoughts. So, which, by LinkedIn the way, might summarize your entire presentation <laughs> in two LinkedIn sentences. Is, is certainly, <laughs> certainly um, a valuable place to be. Um, we often see a lot of education people there, a lot of sales people really engaging in in that space. Um, and yeah, so you can target by seniority and then industry in LinkedIn. But the great thing is Facebook just rolled out targeting that looks exactly the same in their own platform. So now I can target um, whether it's upper level C-suites and executives to high level managers um, at, by like that job seniority and I can target by industry in, in Facebook now. So like this is maybe months old. Um, Facebook targeting. So if you tried to do this a year ago and you know you kind of got stuck or couldn't find the right people, check again. Facebook is always rolling out new um, new targeting parameters and not telling a single soul about it, which is absurd to me. Um, so yes, you can target by seniority and industry in Facebook now, and it's so exciting. And like I said, like people are on Facebook just way more. Like they, they just are. You can also qualify them by income. So doctors are like high level people at um, medical facilities tend to make a good healthy income, right? So you can target, you know, executive C suites in the medical field who make uh, over a hundred thousand dollars. Do you put your data in though? I mean, who puts their salary information into Facebook? I'm just pointing that out. It's like it's, it's a tough call. <laughs> so. Um, Facebook gathers that information from third parties. So this could be your credit card activity. This could be your U.S. Census data. This could be um, any sort of data that, that you've given up. Um, but like it's very much like third party, hard to fake kind of data. Yeah, that's what I think is going on behind, I mean, there, behind all even, of these things. You can even target people by how old their house is or how big yeah. it is. Yeah, Yeah, property size. Here's a good one. I can't help myself here. Love your thoughts on these these answers. Uh, when posting blog content on, on, on Facebook, do you include the link in the copy or delete it as a link window allows clicking through? Are you using uh, so Facebook to link, build link popularity? Is basically the interest, that's the interesting net of that question. Yeah, so I don't think having the link in two different places is going to do much in terms of like the link building. However, I think it's um, it's very fine to add a add a Bitly link to the end of maybe like your your update. Um, I think it's unnecessary for the most part because people kind of understand that when you when you click on the the image or the headline, it, you are taken to to that blog post. Um, but I think that there, there are also portions of the, you know, online user population who are just like really ingrained and trained to click on things that are blue text and underlined. So I think it, it doesn't hurt. Um, you don't need it. Uh, I wouldn't put a, I wouldn't leave the big long URL in there. I'd do a shortened one. Um, but certainly not just only the URL. Um, so you want copy in there um, and shorten it if you're going to have it there. Question for you on images. Um, I, I was surprised that you didn't talk a little bit about Google Image Search and taking these newly crafted uh, images that, you're, that your team or whoever is creating um, and popping them on Google Image Search um, and then getting some action potentially or travel just from the images themselves. Thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I, I think I think in those cases you might want to um, have have your content title or something about your content in text in that um, in that image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I, I think that that's a certainly fine idea. And, and I didn't, you know, you were doing some manipulation of the images, but don't you think creating original artwork is really where it's all going? And if we continue to use this, this, these stock libraries, that our imagery will reek of stock to the point where, oh, I've seen that before. You know, yes. thought, thoughts on the brave new world of creating original uh, imagery and how important that may be moving forward. Yes, absolutely. If you have the the budget and the wherewithal to hire a designer to do custom custom images yes yes do that but um, <laughs> we and we have some really talented ones and uh, we do custom images for a couple of our clients and gosh they look so cool they look so cool but I do know like it takes a lot of time and it, it does t cost money um, designers especially the good ones aren't cheap and so you know, really treating the images from stock, and, and there are a couple um, image sources where you can um, find images that, that are more, you know, seem like someone actually took them with their iPhone or, you know, like Instagram them. Um, so there, there are a couple different image sources that are also free. Um, Creative Commons, I like to use the, the ones where you can, like, distribute and promote for free. I love using those because they look real. They, they do look real. Yeah, with Sarah, Kirst, and Neil, a lot, lot of questions pouring in now about photography. We'll probably talk all afternoon. A couple more quick ones, so I'll just read them quickly, and you can bundle them all up. Um, can you suggest some free, easy-to-use tools for image processing? What program are you using to edit photos? Um, what about adding words and short bits of copy to images? Any experience with that? Maybe you can answer okay, those yes. three quickly. All right. Okay, yes. Add, add text to your image. Yes. Um, I, I do love using like a, a quote or like some, some piece of text from the content in there um, or the content headline, what, whatever it is. Um, make sure it's not too intrusive. Also on Facebook, it has to be under 20% um, of the entire image, just FYI. Really great tactic for Twitter because Twitter doesn't look at the image and, and how much text is in it, so you can get a lot, get away with a lot more there. Um, a couple image tools. So I used um, I used Pixelmator. I'm on a Mac, so I use Pixelmator. It's about twenty dollars for, and it's Mac only. Um, but it gives me like enough tools um, to play around with images. It gives me enough and not too many. Um, loads pretty quickly. When I was on a PC, I used GIMP which um, is very similar to Pixelmator, and I'm pretty sure that's free. So check those out, because I, I know um, Photoshop can be really expensive. Um, some image tools. So I use, uh, let's see, there's one um, that has free photos. It's called Pexels, and if you do www.p E -X -E -L -S com Pexels, so it's like Pixels, but with any um, that's a free image search, and they're they're really beautiful images. They don't look too stock. They're pretty interesting. Like right now, I'm looking at a, a cow's legs on roller skates, on vintage roller skates. It looks weird, but lovely. Um, interesting. Yeah. So those are, so there are a couple that I like, and I like the the Creative Commons for the um, free to street and share. Sarah just reports you just downloaded GIMP and it's free. Um, yeah. It has been so fantastic. Oh, well, one more question came in about uh, uh, so, you know selfies and or images you take on your own. Also huge. Original photography is 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 needs to become the forefront, don't you think? More personalized, more yes. more direct. How much are you using that yourself now? Are you are you daring to take your weekend photos and pop them on your blogs and do creative things and make it more personal? Hey, I, you know what, like, we, that's what we've been advising our clients. We say, you know what, like, take pictures of you guys in the store, um, you know, like, working on cars. Take pictures of, like, you behind the counter. Like, and we want, like, we give them a little guideline of, like, frame it. Frame it well so, like, you know, like, you have the brand in the background but not, like, 
obstructively. Um, you know, make sure you crop in close on the face, and we we give them a little guideline in a cheat sheet. So, yes, use use your own pictures. Like everyone's walking around with a camera. Uh, we think it's really important. We hired a a video and photographer, so um, we have our own little department um, specifically for that. So yeah, really important to do um, custom photos if you have the time and um, and the budget to support that. Mary, fabulous having you on today. I really appreciate you joining this webinar. Thank you so much, Byron. Indeed. Look forward to the next with you. Let us know if you're ready for another whopping presentation at some point. We'll try to work you in. And of course, CMC is coming up. We're excited about Content Marketing Conference, so we'll be in tune with you on that. And um, uh, thanks, everyone, for listening today. Hope uh, your life's a little smarter, better, and faster and wiser when it comes to social media. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next month. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.